Okay, I suggest uh, we get started in order not to run into time trouble again. So, um, once again, good morning uh, from my side. It's uh, great to be back, great to be with you again. And uh, as Manuel has already said, today we will talk a little bit about citizen science and how especially citizen science um, can be uh, used in our school or, you know, is that really possible? And uh, to what extent is that possible? So I just shared my screen. I'm gonna give you a short presentation. Um, actually, uh, let me first of all, uh, give you a little bit the agenda and overview what we would like to do today. So we will split today into two parts. The first one is more focused on citizen science and education in general. We will we would like to discuss with you a little bit your experience or um, your ideas about how citizen science can be integrated in formal education. Uh, talk a bit about the challenges both for the teachers and the students to do that, but also, you know, for the scientists, because uh, obviously a citizen science project might not have as its main goal education, but uh, so we need to also take it in, into account how the scientists look at that. But, uh, you know, overall, we would like to, to understand and uh, kind of also uh, present to you what uh, research has been saying about the benefits of including citizen science activities in formal uh, in even non-formal school uh, education. We will have a break, five or 10 minutes. And uh, in the second part, which is gonna be more hands-on, uh, Manolis will present to you uh, educational scenarios similar to uh, um, or related to what was also discussed uh, yesterday. And um, we would like to get also there your input, your feedback on how this is, uh, is this possible to be used or not. So that's for the second part. Um, I think today, more than yesterday, we would like to hear you, not just, uh, we will have a few Mentimeter um, slides uh, also from yesterday. The lesson learned was that uh, this time we have prepared, uh, first of all, less slides and second of all also uh, in such a way that you can answer them at your own pace. So we're not going together through this, but you will, uh, at some point I will ask you to uh, provide some feedback and then we can a look at that all together. Okay, if there are no questions, please feel free to interrupt me anytime. Um, I will move on. What was not really discussed a lot yesterday uh, is, uh, or maybe you might have not been able to attend yesterday's meeting is a little bit general features about citizen science. What really is citizen science? Um, Many of you yesterday at least have said that they are, have heard about the concept, that they are aware of the concept, but it's, um, uh, I would like to spend a few more minutes today to talk about what kind of are, let's say, the core principles of citizen science. And to start this off, I would like to share and watch with you a small video, just gonna take a minute and uh, to see if uh, you agree or disagree or what is your impression with uh, uh, this definition of citizen science. And I hope you can see it. I hope you can hear it as well. Can you hear the sound? Yes. Uh, yes, I cannot hear the sound. You don't hear the sound. Hmm. This is, of course, unfortunate because uh, I can hear it perfectly. You cannot hear it. Um, th there is an option to share uh, system sound. Uh, same as speakers, switch to audio settings. Yes. But uh, do you know where this? Uh, me... If you go up, yeah. Uh, the, 
when you share your screen, there is a window up. So there are, I think, three dots on the right side. Are there? Share computer sound. All okay. right. So lesson learned. Let's see if this works now. Sixty second adventures in collaborative science. Here's something. Number one, citizen science. Since the study of science began, it's been expanding and evolving faster than you can swipe left. Today, scientists are using technology that would have blown the minds of their predecessors. But the problem is that things like our swanky new telescopes mapping space are producing so much information that even our swanky modern computers can't handle it. Then, in 2007, Chris Lintott and the team at Galaxy Zoo had the idea of asking volunteers if they could help sift through images from space. And it worked. People from all over the world helped out and not only classified and even discovered new galaxies, but spotted and named other astronomical objects as well. This project soon became a collection of projects, the Zooniverse, ranging from decoding ancient manuscripts to spotting penguins in Antarctica. All you need is an internet connection, and everyone in the world can become a collaborative scientist. Now that is mind-blowing. If you enjoyed this clip, feel free to follow... All right. So this was just a, a very brief video uh, um, about one way to introduce citizen science. But what... Uh, just a second. So is, uh, do, do you agree with uh, what we have just seen? Uh, do you have any comments, any reactions to this video? So please feel free to speak up. Just unmute yourself, don't be shy. Let me see. Okay. Well, I, I do have some problems with that video. And um, yeah, it, it is certainly a nice video to give, a, let's say, um, uh, some basic ideas about citizen science and what citizen science can do. First of all, it didn't start with Galaxy Zoo citizen science. Citizen science uh, has been around for decades in various forms and other forms, but obviously the, the Galaxy Zoo, uh, let's say, is a good example for online citizen science where it really uh, uh, got started. And since we are also using uh, in the Reinforced Project, the Zooniverse platform, it's, it's, it's nice to know that this is basically one of the key reasons why Zooniverse uh, exists today is exactly this activity. And uh, let me also share you my, my other, let's say, small problem with this video is that here, the, the way that citizen science is being presented is really that uh, citizens are just uh, uh, invited to, to, yeah, to basically not really collaborate, but just to, to contribute their time and their resources by, by helping to doing some classification. It is being implied that there is more to citizen science. But uh, I, I think here again, um, uh, it, it's a bit simplified what citizen science is. And because of that, I would like to present to you um, some principles of citizen science. And I want us to go through them. And I would like you to look at them uh, also from, especially since you're all educators, from a school perspective. Uh, these are the 10 principles as defined by the European Citizen Science Associations. They are similar principles published by the American Association and the Australian one and all over the world. They are more or less all the same. And they say that these 10 principles uh, are basically or should be integrated in all citizen science activity. And uh, today I would like us to see is this really possible or to what extent this might be possible to do uh, also in the school? So the, the first point obviously is a citizen science project actively involves citizens as uh, in a scientific endeavor that generates new knowledge or understanding. And what I criticized uh, just now in the video 
what they are uh, really emphasizing here is citizens may as act as contributors, collaborators, even as project leaders, but it's important to have a, a meaningful role uh, in the project. Um, can we agree? What do you think? Is this a principle that can be easily applied uh, in the classroom, in school education? Let me open the chat again. Definitely, I see. Okay, I... Yes. Can I ask something also? Yes. Has, has any of the participants ever tried to introduce citizen science to, to their students? Foreign kind of project, I mean. Media says she usually participates in an asteroid hunt. Okay. Yes, so, okay, but I see that so far, at least in the chat, that they have not tried it yet. Uh, okay. So the, the second principle would be then citizen science project have a genuine sign outcome. Okay, I, I think this is kind of independent. Uh, this is more for the citizen science um, uh, project designers rather than for the implementation. But this is maybe also for you a good, uh, let's say, um, criteria to check if this is something you would like to introduce uh, as a real citizen science activity in your classroom to make sure that whatever this project does has a genuine science outcome. Uh, this, the third principle is that both the professional scientists and uh, also the citizen scientists benefit from taking part. Now, this benefit could of course mean several things. For the scientists, obviously it's about uh, creating new knowledge, new understanding, getting better data for the, for, the, for the students. How can students really benefit from it? And uh, it's the question here, because for the, for the normal citizen science, uh, it, it's obviously not only to, uh, about content knowledge, it's also about maybe um, uh, contributing to uh, uh, or being involved uh, uh, in, in the science projects, being mentioned, being acknowledged, uh, benefiting from publications. But obviously, uh, if you would like to use citizen science in the classroom, there must be a clear benefit for you as a teacher and for, for the students. So I, I want you to think about, we will collect this uh, a little bit later, but uh, we, I want you to think about what really could be uh, the, the beneficial outcomes for you to use citizens, si citizen science in the classroom. Uh, another important principle is that citizen science um, may, if they wish, participate. Again, I, 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 I see that it's a bit tricky for me to follow the chat while having the presentation. But uh, let me have a. Uh... I, 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 I can help with that. Okay. Uh, so, for example, Marco here says that uh, the benefits for the students are the great value of participating and discussing, as uh, he sees it. Right, right. And, and, and Wilson says that uh, it may, by solving real problems and giving solutions to them, for example, in climate change. Now, Maria says that. Uh, Students uh, participating will realize that science is absolutely connected with everyday life. Uh, while to let pupils know about up-to-date science is stimulating, Vivian, uh, says Catherine. Actually, yeah, actually you, uh, you can say it also loud. Yeah, yeah. Now that I, uh, I keep these thoughts, we uh, actually um, we will we will. Um, of, of course, I had prepared a Mentimeter to collect exactly this. So hold on for one second. Let me just uh, finish with the principles of citizen science and uh, keeping in mind and, and thinking about how this can be also applied in the classroom. So uh, a, a core principle is, of course, that citizens may, whenever they wish, participate in more than one stages in the scientific process. That means it's not just about uh, you know, uh, analyzing the data or doing a certain classification, 
but ideally they should be involved in the whole process about asking the research questions or questioning the research question, um, helping designing the method, and uh, obviously also in disseminating and communicating the results. The, the core or most projects, most science, uh, citizen science projects that you see will uh, rely on citizens to contribute to specific um, uh, analysis or uh, data gathering or uh, um, uh, the analysis of the data. But actually, citizen science should be much more. It should be really involving citizens in, in, in many, uh, or at least giving them the options to, to participate uh, in more than one stage of the scientific process. The next important is the, and, and I think this is also a, a very interesting and important point for school education, because if you were to use citizen science to help your students understand the, the scientific process and the, what science really means and entails and how cumbersome it can be, uh, I think it would be nice to have projects where this is uh, possible, at least to some extent. Citizen science receive feedback from the project. Obviously a, a very important um, aspect uh, that we really take it to our heart when we are designing our re reinforced uh, projects because also the example of Gravity Spy we saw yesterday, the, the discussion that you can have with a scientist uh, and also getting, uh, let's say, confirmation that your work is really uh, successful or it's, it's helping us. This is obviously not only motivating, but also important for the citizen science to, to scientists to be involved. And we all know that students are thriving much better if they can get feedback on their work. And uh, I think giving them even the option of having then direct feedback uh, with the scientists, uh, this might even help this whole process. Then there are some uh, citizen science uh, principles that might not be so relevant. Uh, this is more for the science teams, let's say behind it, citizen science uh, has to be considered as a research approach like any other, meaning that one needs to be aware of the limitation and the biases that this process also entails. Uh, important again is that citizen science project data should be publicly available. So uh, it's uh, the principle of open science here that should be uh, um, yeah, not only acknowledged but uh, applied. And uh, again, now uh, the, the, the eighth uh, point, very important again, that citizen scientists and their work are being acknowledged uh, whenever there are publication, uh, if there are uh, significant contribution being done by students, by citizens, this needs to be uh, obviously mentioned um, in posters and publications and so on. A citizen science program need to be evaluated also for the scientific output. Again, I think this is more relevant for the science teams than uh, for you as a teacher maybe. But again, this is part of the scientific process. So knowing that, uh, that um, uh, a citizen science project also will be uh, uh, looked at very closely and criticized and so on, uh, I think it's very important. And uh, obviously there are various legal and ethical issues that, uh, you know, inclusion, diversion and so on uh, uh, that need to be into, uh, taken into consideration. I have posted here the link in the presentation where you can find uh, in, in, in more detail uh, the description of these 10 principles. But since I showed this video uh, just now, which introduced, let's say, um, very simple concept or uh, in very simple terms, the concept of citizen science. I just wanted you to understand, obviously there's uh, much, much more behind it. But now let's talk a little bit about uh, citizen science in uh, education. And of course, I had created a, a Mentimeter link and actually it's, I will put it in the, I will put it in the chat so that two ways you can go to menti.com like yesterday and type in the number 21 24 and 68 um, or if i put it in the chat the link you can go directly uh, to the to this uh, yeah to the questionnaires so there are, there are four slides and uh, what is different from yesterday is that you can really go through these slides at your own pace um, 
what you had already mentioned in the chat, as far as I could follow it, at least uh, you can, you have the chance to include there again. Uh, it's the general benefits about uh, the benefits of citizen science in education. Then there's a question about what you believe are the most appropriate roles for students in a citizen science project in a formal education. Um, also, what the next slide is then about what you consider to be really the main challenges. So let's say you, you would be interested to introduce citizen science in your classroom, but um, what you, do you perceive as the main challenges to do that? And last but not least, uh, let's say you overcome all these challenges and uh, you have found a great project to, to implement. What would be your, uh, let's say, desired learning outcomes for the students when using citizen science? So I, I, I give you a few minutes to, to do that. Um, again, you can just click on that link. It should automatically, uh, let me, just check if that is really true. If I click on that link, uh, a browser should op open up. And yes, you're already at the first questions. Once you submit the first one, it will automatically take you uh, to the next one. So there are a total of four slides. And um, I'm going to mute myself and give you uh, two, three minutes to uh, uh, fill in the, the questions before I then will then uh, show you another video and talk a little bit about what the research says about using citizen science in education. And of course, if you have any comments or question, uh, I will try to look at the chat again and obviously you can unmute yourself anytime and just speak up. So I see already quite a lot of answers at the Mentimeter and, uh, but I see that they are still. Would you like to, would you like to share the screen? Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah, I will, I will. I just, uh, I, but I just wanted to say that I can see a lot of answers in the first slides, but I can see that uh, there are still some answers, a few answers only for the third and the fourth slide. So I just wanted to say that we give you a few more minutes before we then uh, look at it together.
So just realize that they are in total four slides for four, let's say, four blocks of questions that we're asking. So once you submit the, the first, the, the potential benefits, then you should see questions about uh, the possible roles that uh, citizens uh, that might be appropriate for students or pupils. The third one is, you know, to name in a word, the main challenges to overcome to integrate citizen science and formal school education. And uh, then if you answer that, you will come to, to the last one about the desired learning outcomes. You have a few options uh, uh, in terms of number of words. You don't need to, uh, you know, if you can come up only with one or two terms, that's absolutely fine. Don't feel pressure to, to use the maximum. We just wanted to give you the, uh, let's say, the chance to submit more than one word. All right, you, as I said, you, you are, have the chance to fill in this at your own pace. Uh, I would say we start, maybe I'm going to start showing you the answers uh, that we have received uh, for the first slides already, because I can see that most of you have already answered that. So let me see, how do you see it? Wonderful. All right. So I'm gonna stop the scrolling. Wait, how does this work? So, and uh, so let me have a look. It says, uh, I know some of my pupils became interested in science and dedicated to become scientists, though activities out of the curriculum and about astrophysics. Okay, so it's about um, uh, creating interest uh, and maybe supporting their choice to select a STEM or a science career path. Uh, and that these are activities maybe outside of the curriculum, I see. Okay, uh, again, the next point is also about generating interest in science, develop an understanding of the scientific process and also to become civic minded. So it's about creating um, um, yes, uh, supporting the, how is it called, the, um, uh, supporting, um, yeah, civic, civic understanding. Um, I'm lost at the word at the moment. Uh, awareness of the human role to take care of our planet. So awareness about, in general, the in environment, I suppose, and the, the effects that human have could have. Okay, that's an interesting point. Uh, the ability for students to actually do real science uh, as part of their everyday life and not in the artificial circumstances that maybe the teacher in a lab creates for them to understand the phenomenon. Yeah, that's a, it's an interesting point. To promote solutions to a real problem for improving lifestyle. Very nice. <laughs> Um, to motivate, empower, inspire students. Ah, meaningful learning, that's an interesting aspect to give them better or uh, deeper meaning to, to their learning that they are doing in school to positively affect their attitudes towards STEM education and professions. Wow, this is a very rich point. Um, develop a community of scientists. Okay, so, um, to maybe uh, also, among the students, but also together with the scientists. Uh, I understand uh, this point as such. Yeah, that is certainly uh, an important. So we, we don't have time. I, I, I can see that there are 41 uh, entries. Uh, I wish we could discuss all of them, but I can see that it goes uh, often in the same direction. So uh, it's about motivation to show them what really science look like, uh, to connect them with uh, the world around them, 
to um, to make them maybe choose science as a career choice. Um, just a second. Manuli, could you also have a look at the waiting room? Okay, so uh, ah, to reduce the gender gap, so to, 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 to use citizen science project also as a way to, to uh, maybe bring uh, or to reduce the gap between female and, and male participants in science. That is certainly uh, also a very interesting point and an important point. Uh, it should it should move. Ah, here it moves again. Uh, to be updated about advanced in science. So yeah, that could also be certainly uh, an interesting point to use this to, to showcase the latest advancements uh, in science. It could be an effective way for learning about the nature of science, how science is produced. Perfect to learn about collaboration, collaborative work. I think that's a very important point. Develop a, a lot of social and behavioral competencies and uh, actual science knowledge, so content uh, knowledge. Cultivating argumentation and skills, uh, developing critical thinking. So. Yes, I, I, these are kind of exactly the answers I was expecting and uh, also hope. And um, I think, uh, I, I thank you very much for, for providing uh, us with this insights. We will obviously analyze this uh, in, in more detail after the, the workshop is done. But is there anything very striking for you? I, I'm doing all the talking. Is there anything that uh, maybe stands out uh, that was surprising for some of you to read, to, to see? Now, I, I seem to have a, a sound problem. Uh, I can hear you perfectly, Jens. Yeah, be, because I see people, I, I, I have the feeling that nobody is speaking except for you, uh, Manolis. Uh, our friends are uh, fond of the chat. I see, perfect. Even better, so we have it even in written, so uh, <laughs> that's fine. So let, let's move on to the, let's move on to the next uh, slide. Um, I can see not all of you have answered it, so please feel free to also answer this. Uh, you, we ask you, which roles do you believe in citizen science are most appropriate for students or pupils? And uh, I can see that there is a clear preference that you think that uh, students are most appropriately uh, for maybe analyzing data, but also for posing questions, uh, um, also to disseminate the scientific work that they are doing to, to others, to use them as a vehicle to communicate about science. And um, uh, lesser so to participate as a stakeholder, a partner to the science teams, uh, but indeed uh, that the, the role of aiding professional scientists in their work uh, seems to be uh, something uh, that you could imagine, providing resources. Yes, I, I uh, understand that this is maybe more challenging. Collecting or uh, gathering data is certainly something that students could do and uh, support others to develop scientific skills. I, I understand this to be kind of like in a collaborative peer-to-peer -peer, uh, fashion. So, but I, I can already see that you, that most of these roles can, in your opinion, be quite well adapted by students. So um, all those different roles that are quite typical for a citizen science project, I understand you find quite uh, appropriate also for your students to do. So this is, uh, I think, uh, quite encouraging to know. And also for you, I think this should be kind of like um, a, a, an inspiration that uh, you can actually do a lot of citizen science with your projects in, in many different roles. And maybe uh, you, you will also see that some students prefer to do uh, uh, the one role more over the other. And of course, uh, whenever there is something new to be integrated uh, or the, a new idea, a new approach to formal education, there is obviously some big, big challenges for educators to overcome. And uh, if I would have to bet money, uh, 
the time and curriculum would be the main uh, problems, um, I would have done it. And obviously, uh, teachers, you as an educator, you are under a tremendous time pressure to fulfill uh, the, the needs of the curriculum. And so linking a, a citizen science project to a curriculum uh, uh, and actually maybe um, uh, making it easier for you to uh, to fulfill the needs of the curriculum, that would obviously be a main advantage or that, that obviously is something that a citizen science project ideally should do. And time is of course always a problem, not only time in the classroom, but also the time to prepare. Uh, this is how I would understand this. It's um, uh, so obviously the, the, the more resources you would have available, the easier it would be for you uh, to, so the less time you need to basically spend in um, preparing or investing into this to integrate it, the, uh, the, 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 the more likely it might become. So technology could be a, a problem depending on, obviously on the on the type of citizen science project the one that we are doing in reinforce obviously requires computers and um, uh, an online a stable online connection motivation yes okay this is uh, this is i think always a problem and uh, i'm a bit surprised to see teachers that uh, that the teachers are the main challenges to overcome so i I gather at least that from the teachers that are present today, you obviously have an interest in this, uh, that you are, you, you probably don't mean yourself, but maybe there are, uh, as, as this is often the case in schools, colleagues that are more motivated, more willing to do new things than, than others. Okay, that, but again, very insightful, and we will do an analysis of the other words definitely um, uh, for our needs uh, later on. and. I think also we uh, we will be able to share um, the these slides with you. Uh, I guess in the Indico we could upload that one or this right. And uh, also, uh, which I'm very much interested to hear is what you think are the desired learning outcomes that you would intend for your students when doing citizen science in the classroom. And I can see uh, cooperation, critical thinking, uh, are mentioned uh, the most. The other words are a little bit too small for me to see from, from this computer screen at least. But uh, I see that it, uh, yes, critical thinking is mentioned quite, uh, quite often. Also uh, the understanding to, uh, of the scientific process to analyze uh, and so on. Okay, but I, I see that this is not as clear cut as maybe the, the, the other issues have been. So there are lots of different uh, outcomes maybe that you would uh, like to see. Okay, I think that that was it. These were the four slides. I, so this is already the feedback that uh, I wanted to uh, to see. Now I need to stop sharing and share my presentation again. Okay, let's see if that works. Perfect. Um, if I want to... Uh, briefly show you another video that um, that we have seen actually no this is just a second to find the right mode here yes so this is a, a, a video and i hope no you will not oh no i need to share again another this is i'm sorry for this Mayor, we're here in Hampton Hills School in Tower. We're here to tell you more about online citizen science. So, what is online citizen science? Okay, online citizen science is where the scientists have gone and gathered a whole pile of data and then they use citizens to help analyse the data. And being online, anybody can do that. And that's where it's really cool in the classroom because we can actually get out there and help the scientists even though you know, we're not trained and we're not, we don't have all the degrees and everything needed, but we can still help them out. Can you give us some examples of this work? Okay, what we're doing with our one is we're looking at the um, skink spotter and we've been finding out all about the Otago skink and how it's endangered and it's in a couple of um, locations in Otago and we're looking at what the habitat, what they like, who their predators are. 
You saw skanks and rabbits and birds and predators and lots of photos and nothing in it. They come out when people are not looking. We're learning more about skanks and really and we're being involved in science. Got it. But uh, are you sh are you sure? Yeah. It has been discovered that adults who were doing this, they were actually learning quite a lot. So we then ask ourselves the question, okay, if adults informally pick up that knowledge, does that happen to kids as well? So if children participate in that, would they learn something about the science behind those subjects? Would they get interested in science? It makes me appreciate well, what scientists do more. It's quite cool doing the real science. It was quite enjoyable because you were engaging in real science and you knew that this had a difference in the world. What have you learned from the Citizen and Science projects? Our work had two perspectives. One perspective was the education. Um, so we were interested in, do children actually enjoy this? Um, does it change their attitude towards science? And um, that happened in four different classrooms in the, in the Wellington region. And the other angle was, how do children use computers to learn about science? Um, the most striking example is children who had devices on their own would open them up and then they would start looking at the screen and they would basically talk to the screen. And when we saw group work happening, children would, in groups to three or four, sit in front of one device, they would look up and they would have a conversation like the two of us. They would look into each other's eyes and talk about what they're looking at. And that is quite a remarkable insight, actually, because it means you do not have to overload the classroom with devices. It is also a partnership between teachers and scientists, so making a real difference. Um, children will learn about science and that will improve society's understanding about science and it will make sure that we create a good environment, that we foster our planet and have scientifically literate people in the future. We hope you enjoyed our video about online citizen science. It's time for lunch, so we better go now. Thanks for watching. All right, so this uh, small video, um, I think it's an inspirational example of uh, a school doing citizen science with younger students. And um, I, I thought that uh, it was also interesting to see that many of the points that you have raised uh, were already kind of also mentioned by these teachers. They were talking about collaboration. The, obviously, uh, the, the, that this helps them to talk about science, that students talk to each other about science, that it erases obviously an interest that they feel involved. And also since technology was mentioned, uh, obviously, uh, you know, okay, you don't have to have uh, a computer for each kid or for each pupil to do this uh, uh, online citizen science, but uh, because of uh, um, these communicative aspects, collaborative aspects also between the students, sharing a computer could even be uh, more beneficial. So these, uh, uh, these video links, they are also in the presentation and the presentation will be uh, uploaded to the Indigo page. I, I just uh, you know, wanted to uh, sh show you this, uh, this small video um, and I, I I'm glad to see that uh, uh, many of the aspects that were specifically emphasized by the teachers in this video, you already have thought of uh, and we could already see in our Mentimeter page there. So um, I, I would really like to continue uh, with uh, the presentation. Let me see what are you seeing. Okay, perfect. And uh, let me swap that and then you should see the full screen. Wonderful. So we have seen uh, the video, we have seen what uh, students, how students can do it. And now I would like to talk a little bit about what, what the research actually shows us about using citizen science uh, in the school. And uh, what was, uh, that was a very interesting article that really I think encapsulates the whole idea. So, so often we are in our classrooms uh, confronted with students that, especially in science topics, they're really asking, why do I need to learn this? You know, why is this important to me? Where's the relevance uh, to my life? So that oftentimes science concepts are too, too far away from 
from what students really are interested in or that they connect with their own personal life. But if we could uh, have them not only collect, but if we could have them use data and actually uh, uh, showcase to them that this is actually having a meaningful impact uh, to, to the real world, to, to the contribution of scientific new knowledge, uh, you know, I think this could be a much better and much more engaging factor to have our students work more enthusiastically with science subjects. And really the, the, the promise of citizen science here, you know, should be con conceived as a win-win because both for the science teams and for the teachers and the students, because you as the teacher and the students, you, you will have authentic access to real science data. You will be able to talk with scientists, interact with scientists. You might even be published. You might be even mentioned. You understand the whole process. And, um, and obviously the, the effect for the science teams is quite clear. If science, citizen science can be integrated in schools, obviously the pool of volunteers can be much, much broader and greater. Uh, and obviously there is also some kind of uh, built in data quality filter the teachers uh, that you know make sure that the, the the students or can better ensure that the students understand uh, for example what we discussed also yesterday the difference between or noise and signal or what are glitches and what are blips and whistles and so on so um, for for the scientists obviously bringing citizen science into school has many advantages but so i think it also has for the teachers and uh, more, most importantly also for the students now there are obviously also these examples we have seen uh, in the video this was talking more about let's say more easy and i put this really in 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 uh, br not brackets but in this um ah what is the term you know i hope no, you cannot see me doing it but um so uh, easy to implement it's uh, oftentimes related to biology wildlife biology or health nutrition and so on but obviously for us, it's more interesting what can, these are projects that uh, maybe are a, a little bit easier to implement, but what about frontier science? How can students and teachers and the scientists contribute to citizen science uh, working with large research infrastructures? And um, uh, in the research, there are some uh, design principles that uh, citizen science projects need to be designed in a certain way in order to be helpful for the school. And again, I thought it was very interesting to see that also one of the most important challenges to overcome is the curriculum. And for us, it's very important that we are able to connect the reinforced citizen science project with uh, the curriculum even at a textbook level. So even though this is very advanced uh, science, this is, uh, um, uh, you know, really uh, not something, um, uh, let's say, like uh, spotting mammals in the, in the forest, uh, even this, there are good ways to connect this to the school curriculum that, um, there should be uh, other levels of advancement in basically uh, increasing difficulty or that you can start with a, a let's say easy task and then uh, improve the, the challenges within the citizen science project. Can I say something here? Yes, please, of course. So uh, citizen science uh, so far encompasses a vast, let's say, variety of topics as discussed before from, uh, uh, I don't know, the cipher in papyri uh, to to do in a gravitational wave noise hunting and so on. You have the, the, let's say, different formats of citizen science. So there are bottom-up initiatives, those that start from uh, the citizens themselves. For example, a lake is polluted in your area and you decide with other citizens to try and, uh, uh, and help clean it. So you create, uh, let's say, a team of citizens uh, you try to find some uh, professionals to support you and you do citizen science and you may just take samples of this. This is fantastic in general. Usually though, bottom-up initiatives mainly refer to easy topics uh, and topics that are, uh, you know, uh, very, very 
connected to uh, people's everyday lives. Now you you can go to bottom, uh, to top-down initiatives. Initiatives such as those that are uh, relevant to rainforest, meaning that uh, scientists need help to in, in a very advanced topic to, to proceed and uh, do science, and uh, they call for uh, citizens' help. These ones, uh, usually the initiative comes from the scientists, and the uh, citizens, uh, if they find it uh, interesting, uh, support them. So there are different levels, so to say. In our case, uh, if you take it from frontiers, in frontiers you have all uh, seen the topics that uh, we want to engage in. Okay, you already are aware about the difficulties to introduce this to the curriculum. Okay, so in a, in a sense, uh, what we are discussing now has no difference from the approach we have in frontiers. We are doing curriculum connections right now with the working groups in Frontiers, and this is exactly what we do also with Rainforce. The main difference is that with Rainforce we are going one step further, which means that we go beyond education, strict education, and we move to citizen science. One of the good things is that, uh, so the same difficulties that you will face in Frontiers and that you are already producing great solutions to them, are similar to those of Rainforce. However, there is one added bonus in uh, the approach that we have here, meaning that the tasks uh, for citizens are usually not extremely complex. This means, of course, that we have uh, various levels of complexity depending on uh, how demanding uh, the tasks are and so on. This implies that uh, you may need, uh, you may not need to do, uh, you know, to start from zero, from special relativity to go to general relativity and then to go gravitational waves and then to, so there are ways to, let's say, to have shortcuts into this. That's uh, what I wanted to say. So similar approach with frontiers, with the added benefits of citizen science and the flexibility of, uh, let's say, uh, a scaling of the tasks. That's what I wanted to say. Yes, and, and as Manod has already pointed out, basically the hardest part you're already working on or you have already found solution for. You, you know how you can connect topics such as, uh, uh, you know, gravitational waves to your curriculum. And you are, I understand that you're also working in frontiers on, on lesson plans, on, on educational scenarios. And obviously that's the second big aspect here that uh, would help citizen science project to enter schools is to have educational resources for the teacher to uh, help them support because it does take obviously some extra effort but if you're already uh, trying to do this in frontiers again you have basically uh, uh, prepared yourself or uh, you know uh, with with uh, the, resources that can build a framework around uh, the citizen science project. And um, obviously uh, you could use also citizen science uh, in a good way to have these uh, aspects of collaboration and that obviously uh, you already had thought of, of the potential benefits in citizen science for the students and also what we had uh, seen in the video that this really helps creating discussions among students. And last not but least, and this is where we come in, uh, you know, teacher training and support is needed. This is why we are doing uh, uh, these uh, sessions today or this is why you're joining the Frontiers online uh, summer school. And uh, I can promise you that this is really just, you know, as I said yesterday, it's really just the start of the journey. There are going to be many, many more events such as these, very specific for each uh, um, topic for each of these four citizen science projects. And uh, there will be also summer schools next year. And um, uh, we don't have exact dates, but there will be webinars uh, specifically made for educators also and of helping you to include reinforced projects uh, to your schools. 
there's obviously a, a second challenge because um, let's say our science teams, especially the scientists working in these large research infrastructures such as CERN or this uh, CAM3 net or even Virgo, they have obviously a very important scientific goals. And we need to somehow balance this. And this is a, a challenge that maybe we can together work on over the next uh, two and a half years. We need to balance what the scientists needs with what the teachers need here. Because uh, these were some designing learning outcomes that uh, we believed uh, are, are key for teachers, that it's project specific learning, discipline, knowledge, you know, sh that should be connected with the topic. Uh, that uh, um, that a citizen science project in school should achieve, increase the, uh, let's say, scientific uh, literacy, but also, and I think we are very much in line and uh, with uh, our overall understanding that uh, working in citizen science project should also help personality wise to develop the students, that there's some personal development, better understanding, but also collaboration and communication and also some small amount of identity change for students to understand, wow, I can even work with a Nobel Prize or in Nobel Prize physics. I thought I'm a complete science idiot, but now I understand this, you know, this science process makes much more sense to me. And uh, so that we really can change attitudes and behaviors and also identities of students that say, ah, I'm not into science, science stay away from me, that they can actually get excited about science or, or have an easy, let's say, uh, way into to science. Um, so we know from research again, that this is basically also true for most of the citizen science project we know from literature, we know from the research that citizen science projects indeed help teach disciplinary knowledge, that they do increase scientific literacy, that they do alter uh, positively uh, attitudes towards science. And, and this is, I think, a, a really a key point that this participation, this aspect of participation is really giving also an increased sense of meaning of school learning. And uh, I, I, I was very happy to see this early and I, I think I pointed it out because I think this is really uh, the key point for me personally, at least in introducing citizen science in school, it gives increased meaning to the learning, which then I guess this will obviously help uh, students to be more motivated to learn about the disciplinary knowledge or to, to be more engaged and involved in science in the scientific process, which then will lead to an increased scientific literacy and so on and so on and so on. And uh, that they are, you know, that knowing that they are playing actually a key role in, in, in big science uh, adventures uh, over, uh, increases overall motivation. Now, that brings us to the end of the first part. Um, I'm talking also a little bit longer than I intended to. But uh, just to make the connections again uh, to, to the reinforce or to point this really out. Um, those maybe that missed yesterday's presentation or that was actually a presentation that, that we had to rush through a little bit. Uh, and I just want to summarize it once more. So the really the whole idea of reinforce here is that we have these large research infrastructures in frontier physics. And on the other hand, we have a society that doesn't really fully understand what they are doing, or maybe also don't appreciate what they're doing. And we really believe that citizen science is the key to connect this, to connect advanced frontiers science with a society by demonstrating, like we did yesterday, small examples to understand that being part of this research process does not mean that you need to have studied physics for many, many years. Um, obviously, you need some help, you need some tutorials, mm -hmm. but if there is an interest, you can see it's not really that hard and still you become, become part of a much bigger uh, uh, thing. And also for the large research infrastructures, it's really important to get in contact with the, with the, with the scientists. Uh, and not only to discuss if this is a glitch or if this is a whistle, a glitch or, or a blip or a whistle or a violin, 
uh, but more importantly also for the citizens to questions a little bit, what are you uh, uh, really researching about and how does this really affect me? So, you know, I think there's really the need to, to encourage a discussion between these two poles. And this is really what we are trying to achieve. We really want this uh, citizen science process and reinforce to be uh, an amalgam of not only contributing by doing classification, but also by, by co-creating, by really influencing the way that the, the scientists think and for the citizens to, to really involve citizens um, more in this, uh, in to, to, to create a better understanding for why so much money is also spent on these research infrastructures. So it's, it's, it's really about also being able for the citizens to express their concerns, their questions, to get into a discussion. So, um, and that's also then, you know, going the next step for students. We already talked now, I think, enough about potential benefits and what we believe and what we would like to actually also confirm uh, and reinforce that this indeed has all these benefits that they can contribute to the development, that they are updated about uh, the, the latest research and uh, can contribute, more, for example, to the optimization of the detectors to increase their overall science capital. So yesterday we talked uh, quite detailed about the gravitational noise hunting. So this is uh, the one big uh, citizen science project um, that is going to, uh, that we are going to develop. We have seen Gravity Spy. We basically will have uh, Gravity Spy 2.0 with enhanced features with, with other aspects to, to look for. So we, will, um, we have already learned yesterday about glitch hunting and these different aspects. And now this is, um, so, but there will be new features. We will use real data collected from the gravity, gravitational wave detectors, both uh, from LIGO in the States and Virgo in Italy. And uh, what's probably gonna be, or what we hope to be most enticing about this is that uh, it will not include only noise features, but uh, there will be, um, uh, or at least existing noise features, but there will be new ones that we also want students and citizens in general to help us uh, label, to find new types of noise patterns. All right. And uh, so, you know, uh, I, I don't want to go into detail uh, here because uh, this is also not my field of expertise, but you can see this is something that we discussed yesterday that this is a spectrogram. We will see over time that there are different, uh, that something is uh, uh, hindering the detectors from looking uh, far back or as far back to the universe as they could. And uh, then we will have uh, uh, these uh, patterns and we need to classify them. Uh, this is, so the second one is the, the deep sea hunters. Uh, also, we, we started talking about that yesterday, not in quite this detail. We had an introduction about what neutrino astronomy really is. It is my understanding also that in part of frontiers, you have already discussed many of these aspects. So, the, uh, to sum it up, there is a huge, huge telescope installed deep under the sea, which detects neutrino coming from, uh, um, yeah, from the depth, from the very deep of the universe. And these neutrinos that they are specifically looking for, they, uh, and they hit the detectors, they, um, uh, they, um, create some light or they create some light signals. However, in order for these detectors really to work properly, we have to eliminate all other sources of noise of other optical signals that might emit from, from animals, bioluminescence from small animals that are deep in the sea and that are uh, emitting light. And there are actually a lot of these small organisms that can uh, do this, that can be luminous. And here, the, really, the challenge will be in order for the detectors really to work and to find those few neutrinos that we are really interested in, we need to el uh, uh, eliminate um, the, the, the noise. So they are, uh, these are some examples of optical signals. Again, um, I don't want to go here into much detail. 
also Manolis already mentioned yesterday the the example of the dolphin whistle that uh, you know this actually were some uh, signals uh, uh, distorting the detector by mating dolphins so th this is uh, also going to be uh, um, so here it's really what we want to do in deep sea hunters is to understand a little bit the patterns here to uh, increase the sensitivity of, of the uh, neutrino detectors and learn about new fields of neutrino astronomy. Mm -hmm. A nice side effect, of course, is that we will get a much better understanding also about the biodiversity that is in the deep sea. And I'm sure you all have heard the, uh, the fact that, you know, we know the universe far better in many aspects than we know you know, the deep sea uh, on the planet that we are living on. So this, I think, um, uh, could be quite interesting. And these studies have really not been done before. So if you're really keen or if you really want to entice also your students that, uh, you know, this is really a chance for making big discoveries, this could be the project for you. CERN obviously is, uh, is a, a very interesting field uh, that has been introduced in school education a lot. So why not? Uh, and I know that there are a lot of activities already taking place together with CERN. So this could be another, let's say, piece of the puzzle. So you could really make your students become scientists in CERN and help them discover new particles. So we, I think you are all aware of the uh, LHC, which is uh, underground in uh, between Switzerland and, and France, and the work that they are doing, the collision of protons there to detect uh, new particles. And again, uh, so this is uh, what um, the Citizen Science Project will do. It's about trying to understand, again, new uh, um, patterns are unforeseen or uh, let's say unclassified uh, unknown uh, traces um, that can lead to new discoveries of new physical particles. And uh, this project will have uh, different levels. So there it, we already know that uh, there will be three different, let's say, ways uh, of increasing the complexity. So stay tuned. We will certainly have also workshops that uh, will introduce this project uh, in, in, in a much greater detail than we can do right here. And uh, a very, very interesting one is um, using the cosmic muons and to do imaging. Uh, also, Manolis mentioned it yesterday already, uh, uh, the, uh, the muons uh, emitting from uh, space, or, but also from other sources, uh, man-made sources, let's say, like radioactivity, it can really help us to scan um, yeah, huge objects, even mountains, to look what's inside. And in order to improve there the, um, uh, the, the, the sensitivity of the, the scanners, basically, um, and to do muon tomography, uh, it's very important for us to, um, and to, to have the feedback of the citizens. And I think this could be, uh, if astronomy might not be so much uh, uh, of interest to your students, this is something that could be maybe more relevant to them, knowing that we can scan, or I think uh, Professor Katsanevas mentioned yesterday also the uh, possibility to scan tombs here in Greece to see if, if this might be even uh, a, a grave. Yeah, and we are still looking for the grave of uh, Alexander the Great. So maybe myon, uh, uh, myography will help us uh, to discover this. So for all of these workshops, for all of these projects, there will be a series of workshops organized. There will be, uh, you will have the chance to even, we will invite you and you will have the chance to see these signs uh, citizen science projects before we are publishing them because we would like to get your feedback there. We would like, especially from you, uh, from the role as the educators here, what you think about that. So uh, stay tuned and um, we will inform you. We will um, uh, uh, visit the website, the social media, subscribe to the newsletter, stay in contact with Manolis and myself, and we will invite you whenever we have uh, let's say, um, practical workshops. 
such as now the second part. And but I think one notice before we go on to the second part, uh, we will have a quick break to uh, definitely uh, yes 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 get a coffee, toilet break, whatever you need. Um, how many minutes you would suggest? I would say ten minutes. Ten minutes. Okay, I'll I'll put a I'll put a timer. So we uh, we know when uh, uh, when we will start again. Right, online timer. Okay. So thank you so much for your uh, um, attention so far, and uh, in ten minutes we will start with uh, the second part. Uh, Mirwat, uh, in your question, if we collaborate outside Europe, yes, yes, uh, these uh, citizen science projects are open to everyone. Uh, everywhere. Uh, yeah, the you know the the good thing about well the good thing uh, I shouldn't say that one of the benefits uh, that this horrible crisis that is ravaging the planet at this moment is giving us is of course it's forcing us also to to expand our our activities to the online world, which obviously as an advantage has that we can really involve more globally uh, participants from around the world. Uh, our initial idea, our initial plan was to have a lot of on-site workshops, which obviously are easier and more effective to some extent uh, to collaborate, to work, to, to gather also your feedback. And as you can see, we are testing out new things uh, in these visionary workshops with also Mentimeter to see how we can engage you best. But uh, obviously a lot of the activities will take place online and really the whole world uh, is invited to join us uh, as long as it's not too problematic with a different time zone. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that is absolutely true. Science is everywhere and let's hope it unites people. But of course, you know, uh, th that's also one of these aspects that we would like uh, to, to change, basically. We can see that there is, um, so there's some bias or there's some, some attitude towards science that is sometimes not easy to understand. And we hope that by involving citizens, even those that might have, uh, let's say, Mm, uh, an unfortunate attitude towards many of the science aspects that by being involved in science activities that they actually get a better appreciation for it. All right, and then hopefully it unites people and we, we can trust science. Okay, so let's break and we'll see, see you back in uh, nine minutes and 57 seconds. Okay. I hope you enjoyed your break and uh, are equally excited for the second session uh, for today. And wonderful. And uh, if Manolis is already with us, I would just pass on the floor to him because he will be walking you through the activities of the second session today. So let's see where, where he is.
Okay, he just said he needs one oh. more minute, so Hello, you have one. one extra. Ah, there he is. Manoli. Yes. It's all yours. Perfect. Uh, is everyone here? Uh, so you were waiting for me. Yes. Bad me. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. So, uh, one minute. I will share my screen. Just give me one minute, please. Okay. So, can you all see my screen? Yes? Yes, yes. Okay, before we begin, I wanted uh, to ask a few questions. I will not be able to see the chat, so I will just uh, listen to you. Uh, the first question is, have we all uh, followed the gravitational waves module, the presentations of last week for gravitational waves on Friday? Yes. Is there anyone who has not? Yes. Okay. Me. Yes, yes. Too. I did not. Uh, saw that. Okay. Okay. So, uh, the first thing that I would like to highlight here is that, uh, as we said before, the integration of uh, glitch hunting to the curriculum is actually uh, similar to in the introduction of gravitational waves in the curriculum. It is the same thing, it's the same issue, we have a different methodology. To introduce gravitational waves in the classroom, uh, we can follow, let's say, two approaches. The first approach is the one that the respective working group is doing. I don't know, do, do we have anyone from the working group here? Gravitational waves? Yes, yes, I am in this group. Who is it? Mirto. In India, okay. So, and, uh, and, the, and Mirto. And Mirto, okay. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yes, okay. Okay. And also Teresa. And Teresa, perfect. So, uh, what you are actually doing in the curriculum uh, in the working group is that based on the scenarios that we have, you are developing curriculum connections. So, activities inspired by these scenarios that you can do with your students. So, this is one way to go. Okay, and uh, we, we are really looking forward for your presentations on Friday. There is a second way to do it now. The second way is uh, a bit more demanding and uh, it is not, maybe it is not applicable to all curricula, which is in a project-like format, meaning that you can have, if you can have a student club for gravitational waves, this is the easiest way to do it because you have time, you don't have school constraints from your school, and you can work with your students. So what I will present to you right now actually follows the second approach. However, uh, I hope that I have identified some very strong connections to, to school curriculum. And the, the analogy we did yesterday for the gravitational wave detector in the human ear was not uh, a chance one. Uh, it was uh, one that connects things uh, to what we want to do. So, uh, Either you can take it as a standalone activity, focus mainly on the aspects of sound and the connection to gravitational waves, or you can do a, a six, I don't know, a six month uh, project with your students, a few month project with your students to introduce gravitational waves and from there go to glitch hunting. Overall, citizen science is a continuous process, meaning that uh, it's not something like we do an activity in the lab and it's done. It is something that uh, when students get used to it, they can keep uh, classifying, they can keep participating themselves. Okay, this is something you need to know. So, before uh, starting with, uh, before starting with uh, this, before starting with the glitch hunting, I want to remind you a couple of things about gravitational waves because they will be very useful for our uh, next steps. Okay, okay. So I will share screen sound, computer sound. Okay. 
Hey, I actually think you shouldn't skip this ad, even though most ads are super irritating, because I think you're going to really like what I have to tell you. I'm Jonathan from AJ and Smart. We're a digital innovation agency based in Berlin. We work with some of the biggest companies in the world, and my job is I'm a workshopper. So, what is a workshopper? A workshopper. We don't care. Sorry about that. He's a workshopper. Being a workshopper is good, but not relevant. Okay. So. What is a gravitational wave? It's a ripple in the fabric of space and time. Imagine that space is a giant sheet of rubber. Things that have mass cause that rubber sheet to bend like a bowling ball on a trampoline. The more mass, the more that space gets bent and distorted by gravity. For example, the reason the Earth goes around the sun is that the sun is very massive, causing a big distortion of the space around it. If you just try to move in a straight line around such a big distortion, you will find yourself actually moving in a circle. That's how orbits work. There's not an actual force pulling the planets around, just a bending of the space. Gravitational waves are produced whenever masses accelerate, changing the distortion of space. Everything with mass and or energy can make gravitational waves. If you and I started to dance around each other, we would also cause ripples in the fabric of space and time. But these would be extremely small, practically undetectable. Now gravity is very weak in the scale of other forces in the universe. So you need something really, really massive moving very, very fast to make the big ripples that we can detect. How would you observe a ripple in space? If the space between you and me stretched or compressed, we wouldn't notice it if we had made marks on our metaphorical rubber sheet, for example, using equally spaced rocks, because these marks would also get stretched further apart. But there is one ruler that doesn't get stretched, one made using the speed of light. If the space between two points gets stretched, then light will take longer to go from one point to the other. And if the space gets squeezed, light takes less time to cross the two points. This is where the LIGO experiment comes in. It has four kilometer long tunnels and uses lasers to measure the changes in the distance between the ends of the tunnels. When a gravitational wave comes through, it stretches space in one direction and squeezes space in the other direction. By measuring the interference of the lasers as they bounce between the different points, physicists can measure very precisely whether the space in between has stretched or compressed. And the precision needed is incredible. To detect a gravitational wave, you need to be able to tell when something changes in length by a few parts in 10 to the 23. It's like being able to tell that a stick one sextillion meters has shrunk by five millimeters. The effect of a gravitational wave is so minuscule and easily confused with random noise, you need a smart data analysis technique. Scientists hope to identify the patterns of gravitational waves by comparing the wiggles they measure in the experiment to the wiggles they expect from the gravitational waves. That's like trying to identify a song being hummed at a noisy party. A very, very noisy party. Imagine your whole life you had been deaf until one day your hearing was restored. You'd be able to explore the universe in this whole new way. That's why detecting gravitational waves is so significant. It's a completely new way of studying the universe. Anytime there's a new way to investigate the universe, we discover things we didn't expect. It's really about looking for new things we didn't know existed, examining the extreme edges of our knowledge of physics, and testing our theories about how the universe works. Uh, whoever likes, uh, there is a book that these guys have made called We Have No Idea, which is completely, completely awesome. So, I think that this gives a, a nice overview of what gravitational waves are. Is, is this, uh, this clear so far? Yes. 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 Perfect. Yes. yes. The, this also, by the way, when uh, I'm doing uh, workshops uh, for gravitational waves for students, this video always captures their attention. Uh, starting with that is a guaranteed way to uh, have their attention. Now, we go one step further. We have, uh, for those who have followed uh, the, um, the gravitational waves module, we had the presentation of the Michelson interferometer, if you remember. So if you want to do this as a project with your students, the next step would be, after discussing a bit gravitational waves, to show them how the interferometer works. I will not do that now, but I will assume that uh, we all have uh, a good idea what this is about. But if we don't, let me, for one minute, uh, to show you uh, another short video of how things work, okay?
So how do we detect these gravitational waves? Well, about 1.3 billion years ago, two massive black holes collided and made one supermassive black hole. And when that happened, it gave out a lot of energy in the form of a gravitational wave. Now, this gravitational wave itself, what it did is it kind of sent out ripples through the space-time. And effectively, these ripples, as space-time is kind of uh, stretched and compressed, have gone out throughout the universe. And what we have then is we have an array of detectors on Earth which actually detect uh, the change in the dimensions of the universe. So to detect these gravitational waves, what we need is a massive detector. And this is where LIGO comes in. Now that stands for Light Interferometry Gravitational Waves Observatory. And there are basically a couple of these things which are basically um, something with a laser at one end. We send a laser beam down two separate four kilometre long tubes in, in a vacuum, which are at right angles to one another. And what we can then do is see how much uh, maybe the, the dimensions change in this direction compared to this direction. So put simply, what we have is a laser. Now this laser fires out a beam of coherent light, and what we then do, we send it through a partial mirror at 45 degrees. What this means is some of the light gets uh, reflected this way, and the rest of the light continues in a straight line. Now at the other end, what we have is a mirror. And this is where you know, there's a, such a, an amazing piece of engineering that's gone into you know, making sure that these mirrors don't move at all. So the ray of light comes out the laser, it hits the mirror and then it bounces back. So it comes back down uh, just like this ray of light here. So it goes up and down a four kilometer long tube. What happens here is that when the two rays of light, if they are completely in, in antiphase, as we call it, the wavelength of one uh, ray of light cancels with the wavelength of this ray of light here. And what we see then is that this ray of light plus this one here equal no light at all. Effectively, the top of the wave here cancels with the bottom, and therefore we don't see any light. And this ray of light basically passes through the mirror to our detector. But if we have a gravitational wave which is moving through the Earth, you know, perhaps from some massive event a long way away, what it's doing is actually changing the dimensions. And that means at some point, uh, this distance here is going to be less than that. What happens then is that rather than these two waves being in antiphase, uh, it shifts it along slightly. And what we might have then is some constructive interference. And what we see then is we get a, a, a signal in our detector. And the only way that this can happen is if we have a gravitational wave. Now, in terms of the distances involved, this is about four kilometers. And the distance that this has to move is about a thousandth of the diameter of a proton. This is the size of the, you know, the, the center of the atom, okay? So in terms of the distance moved, it is absolutely minuscule. And therefore, this is why it's taken so long, over 100 years, to actually prove that Einstein was right. But it's all based uh, on the work being carried out at LIGO, uh, at the various detector stations, and it's an international collaboration. Now, if you'd like to find out more about this, uh, I've put a load of links to very good videos uh, in the description below. So have a look at that, you know, try and, you know, just sort of test yourself and challenge yourself and have, you know, really kind of uh, look at this part of the most fascinating uh, physics that's happened. Okay, so now that uh, we have uh, seen that, I believe that we are... Uh, Famil not familiar, but we have got an idea both about gravitational waves and what a gravitational wave detector looks like. Okay, here we presented the American one, LIGO. Uh, in Frontier Center Air Force, we work with the European one, Virgo, which has the difference that it is its arms are one kilometer shorter than LIGO, mainly. So, any questions so far? No. No? No. Perfect. So, now I want you to imagine the gravitational wave detector as a near. Okay, it is a near. And now I will uh, repeat the analogy of yesterday because this will be the basis of all our uh, narrative today. So, your friend is coming a tune at some distance from your ear and the ear will listen to that tune. So, you will be able to identify your friend singing. Now, as discussed again, when the distance increases, and if we assume that your friend keeps his voice at the same level, he doesn't increase uh, the loudness of his voice, uh, we will again l understand that he is singing, but the signal that we will receive will be weaker. Okay? Why? Because sound travels in waves, waves uh, propagate as spheres around the source, and the larger the distance from the source, 
the energy is distributed over a larger area. Therefore, if we get our ear, which is uh, which covers a very small portion of the area, this means that similarly, a small portion of the energy emitted by our friend will reach our ears. And what is the experimental effect? The sound will be weaker that we sound that we hear. You can see the effect here. Okay, so a more sensitive ear will be able to listen to your friend humming from a greater distance. So the main thing that I want you to keep in mind for the next steps is that more sensitive ears can identify signals from larger distances. Similarly, a gravitational wave detector's sensitivity corresponds to how far in the universe it can reach. Something that you need to take into account is that the first gravitational wave uh, that was observed in 2015 by LIGO, the energy emitted during the collision of the black holes in terms of gravitational waves equals three times the rest energy of the sun. This means in simpler terms that if we had a, a collision and new particles, new stuff was produced instead of waves, uh, you would uh, have the creation of three suns, more or less. The energy emitted is tremendous, unbelievably uh, large. And uh, more than that, when you go uh, to, in terms of luminosity, you will see that all the visible stars in the universe uh, emit le altogether less energy than this that was emitted by this collision of black holes that we detected in 2015. However, this collision took place many, 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 many miles away from us, many parsecs from us, many light years, billion, I think it was one point something billion light years. This means that similarly to sound, the signal that we would get would be very weak. Okay? Therefore, in order to get it, we need a very sensitive detector. So, the point is now that if there was nothing else in the universe, and only the gravitational wave source somewhere in the vast uh, universe, and our detector on Earth, we would be able to detect it with no problem. The thing is, though, that the detection principle that we have okay, is subject to noise. And as we have a very sensitive ear, this gravitational wave detector ear, uh, noise will be very important because uh, we, it will create problems with our detection. So we need to control it and eliminate it. So trying to detect gravitational waves is like trying to uh, find, to listen to our friend's song in a very noisy party. So, we have said that different sources of noise affect the gravitational wave detector sensitivity, but now, in our session today, I want to see this in more detail. So we have developed an, an, an educational scenario in Frontiers that can be adapted here. The link is in this slide. When you join, when you enter this link, you will be able to, uh, to visit the, the place, uh, the scenario. This is uh, made in the GoLab uh, authoring environment. And you all, the only thing you need is to enter a random password, whatever you like. I will not go through all the things because the first part is an introduction, which you have heard already. The second part is the detection principle, which you have heard. I will go exactly, precisely to the hands-on activity. And the hands-on activity is to build a gravitational wave detector, a virtual one, ourselves. So I'm moving from here. The link to download this app is in this scenario, again, all the links, all the presentations will be in the Indico page. So uh, no problem here. And I move to the app. Can you see my screen perfectly? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. so, this is called Space Time Quest. I actually, before going there, I will give you the link also to download it if you like and play yourselves. 
I, actually, I will give you the link to the scenario. That's better this way. Uh, one moment, please. Set. No. Oh, come on. Okay, this, this is actually, oh, no, sorry, I, I, I sent to, to Jens only. So, uh, okay, I sent it to you and I also sent you the link to the, the, the space time quest. Copy link address, so you will be able to see it right away if you want. So, I'm taking you there now. So, I entered my name, and now I will... Uh, Manolis, and now I will enter my detector's name, whatever. Now, the first thing that uh, we have in this app is how to... Uh, where do we want to put our detector? For example, if you choose the city... I don't know, I interrupt. Yes. The game seems to have a background sound, music. Yes, uh, I don't know how to cut it. Uh, if you, if you, because I think now we don't, at the moment, we don't need the computer sound. So ah, okay, what perfect. I had to activate, maybe you need to deactivate in Zoom that you're not sharing your computer sound. I, I did it now. Is it okay? Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Okay. So you see here in the city that the detector has a lots of noise. Why? Because we are in the city. We have seismic noise. We have cars passing by. We have people talking. We have everything. You have a mediocre budget, but you have a lot of support. On the contrary, if you put it, for example, in the desert, noise is optimal, budget is, uh, support is bad. Which one would you choose? Someone? The first one? The city? The city, city yes. W why? Uh, to analyze, we have to have a good support and mm -hmm. a good budget. Yes, but the noise is uh, actually too much. Yeah, but with budget and a good budget and a good support. Okay. Uh, we can, like that, um, we can, I don't know how to say. Okay, uh, I, I will follow your approach. Okay, thank you. So. This is your office now. You see your budget here in pounds. Okay, you have uh, something less than 100 million. And now, here is different controls that uh, will, uh, you know, you will need to buy components and uh, install it in your detector. The important thing to see here is this curve. What do we observe here? We observe detector noise level. This is actually what we call the strain. The strain is the effect that a gravitational wave has in our detector. So this means here that with all the noise taken into account, uh, the, str the strain that you can observe is of the order of 10 to the minus 18, more or less, at a frequency of 100 Hertz. What we want in order to be able to detect gravitational waves from far away is to increase our sensitivity. And what does this mean? It means that we need to reduce, let's say, our noise level so that we are able to detect strains which are weaker than what we can do now. Is this understood? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So we will be consulting this, uh, this plot here Okay, as we will be doing our modifications, and something that I wanted to point out is that uh, th only this plot and what we will do uh, themselves can create many links to the curriculum. So, let's move. Uh, sorry, may I interrupt here? Um, are you, you talking? May I interrupt here? I have a question. Yes. Are you talking about that we have to minimize? the noise in order to get the signal. So yes. um, uh, what measures do we take to minimize the noise in the detector? You will see now. So we will start from environmental noise. Okay. 
you see that we have three options here. The first one is the detector depth. I will have to have you know that uh, LIGO and Virgo are all surface detectors, okay? Uh, which means that they are not, we haven't dug deep in order to place them. But Kagra in Japan is placed underground in order to minimize seismic noise. If you have, um, if you remember your seismology a bit, you will know that uh, when we install a seismometer, we want to install it close to the ground or to the underground of our building in order not, for it not to be affected by uh, outside sources of noise. More or less, it's a similar approach. So, the second part is the vacuum. Why do we need a vacuum? We need a vacuum because the, the light that travels to and fro the, the mirrors in the gravitational wave detector does not, uh, should not be perturbed by molecules of air around. So, because that would uh, destroy our timing and from that it would destroy our detection potential. I will start with that actually. You see that the, the metric that we have here is the how many pumps per kilometer we have. Okay. You will also see that the residual gas is one of the important uh, aspects here. So if I start increasing the pumps per kilometer, you see that the orange one drops. Do you see that? Yes. Okay. I will leave it here for now. I go back now to the detector depth. So the deeper we go, the better it is. The seismic noise is actually this yellow curve here. And this is actually a resonance curve for those of you who are teaching oscillations. But it is a resonance curve far off resonance. It is at the point where we say, OK, in classroom, we don't observe anything. But in here, even off resonance, we observe something. So if I dig deeper, you will see that the noise drops. However, not that much. So I would keep it uh, something like this here. You see that the cost, that the money, the cost is very high here. Okay. So I would go, let's say, to let's, uh, should I take it to 200 meters for now? Yeah. Okay. 201, we're large. Now we have the third thing, the detector cooling. Detector cooling is very important because when the temperature increases, the mirrors, the molecules on the surface of the mirrors start boiling, boiling. They are, they are moving more rapidly, more chaotically. This again will affect the reflection of light in the mirrors. So we need to cool these things. In Virgo right now, we don't have this mechanism. So they correct it by having a mechanical support system. In, and you see the mirror thermal is this one. And actually the effect is not that high. You see that the main sort of source of noise is the so-called shot noise. So we will go back to the office and we will try to reduce this shot noise. So we go to the optics. Shot noise is a quantum uh, sort of noise. Uh, when photons travel, they integrate in, interact with the vacuum. And when they interact with the vacuum, they may get some randomness in their motion, so to say. Uh, therefore, the more photons we have, the less ra randomness overall. This is one way to explain. So actually, this shot noise is reduced when I increase laser power. Why? Because laser power means more photons. So uh, the, um, uh, the noise, uh, let's say, over the, the percentage of noise will reduce. So I increase laser power now. Can you see? We, mm -hmm. have, we have something here, something good. But even more so, if I go to the mirror roughness, the quality of the mirror, this is where things get uh, interesting. You see? So right now I have created the sensitive detector at about 500 hertz. Now I need to reduce, which sources of noise would you reduce actually? As you see it. Uh, 
radiation the pressure. Suspension thermal. Yes. Uh huh. Yes. Suspension thermal. Suspension. Yes. Yeah. Suspension pressure. Okay. Mirror thermal. Yes. Okay, let's go back then and go to the vibration isolation here. Okay, here we have how many stages we put uh, our detectors. If you remember, if we have pendula, the one below the other, what you see is that it becomes more isolated in terms of vibration. We can discuss further if you like about that. Let, let's see what happens. You see? By, by adding more stages here, Actually, I become more sensitive in a broader range of frequencies. But again, the problem here remains, which is the mirror thermal noise. So I think we need to cool things a bit. Mm -hmm. we What hear you? What happened? Uh, Manoli, we do not hear you. Okay, uh, it seems to me that Manolis has some technical issues. Okay, uh, he just, uh, yes, he just contacts me, he or my mobile. Apparently his computer uh, had some issue. He had to log out and he's gonna log in uh, in a second. So sorry for that. Yeah. And it's unfortunately not in my uh, expertise to continue this. I would love to continue this. I think it's a, quite a fun uh, tool to use. But um, unfortunately, I mean, maybe somebody of you would like to continue. <laughs> I think you are more qualified than me to talk about gravitational waves. No, no, he, he will be back in a second. Ah, and there he is. Hello, Manoli, we missed you. I'm sorry for that. It seems like uh, the computer decided to restart. So uh, I, I, I deeply apologize and uh, I am uh, back in action. Perfect. Okay. It, it was a nice break. So are we still here? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. You need uh, to share your screen again. Yes, 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 I will now. Okay, one moment. Where is my share screen? Okay, so. Manolis, can I put a question? I'm in course. the game. I'm Teresa. I'm in the game and uh, I have already in the budget minus and I can put this. It's uh, had uh, the budget. How I put uh, this uh, in the height. You, ne you need to compensate, actually. And this, this is the harsh reality of, uh, of modern research. We don't have as much money as we want. But I, I start the game and uh, it's always the, the same. I begin with the uh, budget and uh, minus something. It you cannot start with a minus budget. If you do this means that for some reason your settings are um, are somehow like that. You okay. need to, to restart it maybe. Okay, okay, so let me make a quick uh, comeback to, to, to our settings. Okay. 
So I dig, uh, we have dug. We make it like this. We cool a bit more. Okay, we have the short noise to reduce. Okay, you can see here now that uh, by, uh, now I'm in a minus myself as well. Okay, we don't like that. If I go here, uh, you you can see that my sensitivity is much, much better, but I have, I have no money now. Okay, so I will need to compensate again a bit. For example, I will reduce not my suspension cost, maybe my drilling cost, which, which is, this is actually a very nice way to do stuff with your students because they will uh, understand also how science, uh, how science funding works, more or less. And in order to manage, you need to make some, um, some compensations. So, do you see the sensitivity card here now? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, I have some more money. I will try to make the, the detector a bit more sensitive. And I will do that by changing. Aha, uh -huh, here we have few silica, no, silicon. So, mirror thermal, thermal noise is affected by mirror material. You can see that we reduced it, the blue line here. Okay, and we have some more money maybe to reduce uh, radiation pressure. Radiation pressure is about the detector, uh, the, the light that we send to the detector, it presses the mirror, so it makes them move. So you see that th this is not an easy thing to do. It is a very, 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 uh, you know, it has many parameters you need to control. And this is uh, somehow the beauty of it. Okay. But if I presume that if I in in add some more stages, okay, I reduce that. But if I make my mirrors a bit heavier, voila. You see, but I have no money now, so. Okay, so we actually made a very sensitive detector right now, which is a, a, a bit more sensitive than, than Virgo is at the moment. So, but we have no money again. So we will reduce some stages here. You see, you need to compensate. Here we are. So. I believe we are ready to do a science run. We have made the detector as sensitive as possible. We do science run and see what we get. What will we see here? How far in the universe we can hear with our gravitational wave detector ER. I like the rhyme. Can you see that? Well, you see now that our detector is actually extremely sensitive. It can detect a gravitational way, gra uh, sorry, black hole mergers. It can detect neutron star mergers, and it can also observe uh, many galaxy clusters itself. So, uh, so I get out of this one now. Do you have any questions about that so far? No. No. <laughs> okay. I so, I, I think you liked it. I'm glad. So, we played a bit with noise in gravitational wave detectors. This is something I have done with students. They were excited. I believe that uh, you can do it as well. And... Uh, we can now show them what we showed yesterday. I will not focus a lot on that. Uh, some real data of uh, gravitational wave uh, noise hunting. So, for example, here you see a, a measure of the range in the universe that Virgo can observe. This is actually what we call BNS range, and it means that the range that the detector, uh, the distance up to which a single detector can observe two 
neutron stars merging we signal to noise ratio of eight, which means that the signal is eight times louder than the noise. Okay, and you see here that when an earthquake, this is so therefore this is the range in the universe, range in the universe over time. Also, you need to know that the uh, range in the universe, we, we are in the center of a sphere, which means that uh, we can hear from all around us for four pi star radians. Okay, so you see here, this means that we have a big horizon, therefore we can measure many sources, and this is why actually we have many gravitational waves that we observe, uh, many sources. Now here you see the effect of an earthquake on uh, on the rains uh, on our horizon, let's say. So this means that uh, when an earthquake happens, we can actually not detect. Okay. The same goes for the wind blowing. I, I explained this yesterday, so we don't need to do that. So I believe that th this is the first part of uh, of this presentation. Okay, in which we discuss noise hunting in gravitational wave detectors. The next part will be glitch hunting. Before I go there, do we have any questions, any remarks? Uh, yes, it's not easy to understand um, the lines you just shown. I mean, is every peak down means your detector is not able to detect something? Can you speak up a bit because I cannot hear you very well. I mean, when you every time you've got a drop to the bottom, does that mean that the detector is not useful? You can't use it? More, more or less, yes. Yes, okay. And, you, and I, could, could you go I, back to the slide, exactly? Yes, yes, yes. You see here, first of all, that there are periods where we are not uh, measuring. Okay. You see, you see here, now we can correlate this and that. Maybe, of course, uh, there are ways to, if a signal comes, there may be ways to disentangle it from uh, the, the spectral characteristics of the signal. So what, is the, what is the line below? The line? The, the one, the green and red one. Where does it come from? This one? Yes. This comes from an earthquake that took place in Magula. It, it has an epicenter in Magula, yeah, Yes, Greece. that I understand, but it's, it's from... Um... This one? No, I mean it's the, the green and red. It's not from, from the detector then. Actually, this is the horizon, okay? The horizon drops when, some, uh, when a very noisy signal comes, when uh, we have a, an earthquake. Why? For example, because the mirrors move. As the mirrors move, you lose your timing, and when you lose your timing, you lose sensitivity. Yeah, yes, I understood that. It's just I, I want to know if the green and red lines are from a seismic detector or from the gra gravitational wave detector. This is gravi the top is gravitational no, no. wave, and the, the bottom, bottom is a seismometer. Okay, okay. This fine. is seismometers that are installed in uh, around uh, the Virgo detector. Yes, and this is actually right. something that uh, you will do in uh, our uh, citizen science project uh, when it is deployed. So, Thank other you. questions? No? Okay. So now that we have an overview, this activity, if you want to do it with your students, it needs about three hours, more or less, three to four classroom hours, if you do it li uh, like this. So I would like to introduce spectrograms now. And this is the connection that we can make with sound. As we said, gravitational wave detectors resemble very sensitive ears. And the very important visualization to understand the signal coming from this detector is a spectrogram. It is actually a 3D plot. And this is how we will make our curriculum connection with sound. So when a sound comes in, you will see it in, in an interactive fashion in a moment. Uh, you can you usually see the waveform of sound, okay, uh, which means that it is a plot in which in the y-axis we have pressure or decibels or uh, uh, displacement and in the x-axis we have time. Here, what we do actually is that we have uh, the spectrogram. I, I will try to, to make it a bit more clear actually. Let me go to another platform. 
that might help this one. Okay. Uh, okay, so you hear me speak right now, okay? Yes. Okay, what you see here is the waveform of my voice. In the y-axis, you measure usually pressure, decibels, or it's, a, it's equivalent in millivolts when we transform pressure to, to voltage. And when I speak, you see here that we have the frequency spectrum, which means that as I speak, some frequencies are more prominent than others. And this depends actually on the source. Uh, if you speak and say the same things with me, other frequencies might be more prominent. So this is a histogram which shows the frequencies that are prominent as I speak. Now, if I speak for a long time, you will see that some frequencies will change and we will need to see how this pattern actually changes over time. So this is what the spectrogram does. Okay, if I whistle now, you see that we have some frequencies in which we hear most of the sound, let's say. Okay, when I speak, here you see frequency, here you see time, and the color uh, shows actually the energy that is um, distributed in different frequencies. Is that clear? Yeah. Okay, let me take you now, since we, we got that, let me take you, where is it? I had it, where is it? Uh, one moment, uh, come on, seriously. Uh, I had it in the presentation, I will put it back now, okay. I want you to have a look and play with the spectrogram actually. So I will offer this to you to the chat if you would like to play a little bit. And, uh, okay. Okay, here it is. Yes, exactly. Uh, to, today we focus on that, Mirwat. So, this is a spectrum analyzer which uses actually some predefined sounds in order to, to see their spectrograms. So, again, we have the frequencies here and the time on the x-axis. And we have some different uh, sources of uh, sound. So, I will start with an orca killer but you cannot hear my screen, of course, my sound, of course. Ah, come on, no, not now, not this one. I go back, I share computer sound. So, listen carefully. These were orca killers, a killer whale. So, this is the sound it emits. You can see the frequencies here and how it emitted them over time. I go to a police siren. You see that? You have a, you are around 400 hertz and you have an oscillation here, which means that frequencies go back and forth. It is a, a something like the Doppler effect here that you can, uh, if, if you would like to, to go deeper, that you see. And you see at, that some, at some points in time, frequency increases. So by playing with this, you can introduce your students, first of all, to what a spectrogram is. And you can go deeper if you like. And I, I will try to go deeper a bit. Okay, I will use this uh, this tool uh, in which we will actually synthesize. Uh, it doesn't. Ah, uh, it's down. So, a bit. Anyway, uh, I think that now the concept of um, of spectrogram is pretty much understood. Are there any questions? No. Okay, so no. what has it got to do with gravitational waves? Let me show you. This is the gravitational wave that was detected uh, in 2015, the, the beginning of gravitational wave astronomy. And what you observe here actually is its spectrogram. Let me show it to you. Can 
you hear it? Yes. Yes. A question. A question would be, okay, why does a gravitational wave sound like that? The gravitational wave sounds like that because when the Welcome back, everybody. My next guest is a professor of physics and mathematics at Columbia University, a best-selling author and an all-around smarty pants. He's here to tell us about the discovery of gravity. So, why does it sound like that? It sounds like that because when the two black holes, uh, in this example, start in spiraling around each other, at some point, uh, as they spiral, they emit gravitational waves. But as they come closer, they spiral more quickly. And as they spiral more quickly, the frequency of the gravitational waves increases. Now, this frequency of the gravitational waves is the, uh, in the acoustic range. So we can easily sonify it and listen to it. And this is what you observe, actually. It's a sweep sound, a sound that increases frequency uh, with a specific uh, pattern over time. You see it? This is how the strain goes, actually. The frequency increases, and you observe it also in the spectrogram. Okay, this is what a gravitational wave looks like in our detector. So, by understanding this, you might be able to understand also that there are sources of noise that we can eliminate, such as the earthquakes, but there are sources of noise that we cannot. These are the glitches. I go back to the original plot, and you will see that as we have the reach of the detector, how far in the universe it can see, as we discussed before, there are some noise triggers, as we call them, that uh, worsen our sensitivity, and thus they uh, make our detector unable to detect gravitational waves. These w might be earthquakes, this might be uh, the wind blowing, and we can disentangle them, actually. So if you go back, for example, here to the earthquake stuff, you see that here we have an earthquake. Here we don't. Most probably, these are glitches. These are noise triggers that may come from other sources that we cannot understand. What sources? We don't know. There might be a truck driving fastly, and the truck driving fastly induces seismic noise, and this seismic noise goes to the detector, but of course we would have detected it here. It might be your mobile phone, your friend right that moment sent you an SMS, and the electromagnetic signal interfered with the detector and induced a glitch. There might be something else. We don't know. But we need to find it out, because you see that all these horizon drops here induced dead time in our detector, meaning that if you took them all together from the, let's say, one hour here, uh, you don't really detect one hour. You don't uh, have, uh, let's say, uh, one hour duty cycle. You have less than it because a part of it is dead time due to glitches or other sources. So this is actually what we are here to do. What is glitch hunting about? Okay, these noise triggers that make their way in our data and introduce dead time in the detector and mimic gravitational wave signals. I would like to focus a little bit on this plot and I will be finishing in two minutes. Okay. You see the line here? Huh? Yes. This is a spectrogram. Now you know what this is. So you can understand what this plot shows. I, I will try to make it a bit bigger actually. Uh, in order to, uh, to to show it in more detail. Okay, so I go back to the presentation. Here, this is a spectrogram, frequency over time. And here, the line that you see here is a gravitational wave. Once again, you saw it previously. It is the same thing. This was detected in 2017. But right at the moment when the gravitational wave was being detected, a glitch came, this noise trigger. So uh, this one, we were able to detect the gravitational wave, but we lost part of the information due to the glitch. Now you understand possibly why glitch hunting is so important. So what is the next step for us to do? The next step is to go as we did yesterday with our students, 
to do glitch hunting with Gravity Spy here. We have different typologies of glitches that we, citizens have identified, such as the blips. So you see a blip that has short duration here, but a broad range of frequencies. You see a whistle, which has a, a larger duration and a smaller range of frequencies, which are usually higher, and other sources that you saw yesterday. So, would you like me to go to, uh, to Gravity Spy now, or do you think that uh, we should uh, finish for the moment and, and you are happy with uh, the yesterday presentation of Gravity Spy? No, you can go on. What? You, you may yeah. do Continue. more. To do it again? Okay, I, I will show, uh, Jens, do I have time? What, what else is coming afterwards? I mean, obviously there's interest to have a look at Gravity Spy again, so let's do that. Okay. But let's not uh, do it for half an hour. No, 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 it will be five minutes or so. So, all of you have seen Gravity Spy. I copy the link to the chat. Okay. You, <laughs> Marina says you want more. Okay. So, uh, this is the link to the Gravity Spy. I remember Emmanuel uh, yesterday said that he had already become, uh, had unlocked stage two. Today I will not connect, I will not sign in. So I will say it from the point of view of someone who hasn't uh, worked with uh, Gravity Spy before. Okay, once, uh, so once again, this is a project which helps scientists at LIGO and Virgo search for gravitational waves by uh, reducing by cataloging and identifying these sorts, these sources, these glitches. And uh, we discussed this yesterday as well, that uh, there have been citizens who have identified the new sources of glitches. They have contacted the scientists through TOC, actually, through this facility called TOC. And the scientists went back in their data, they saw the problem, and they understood its source uh, in uh, the per dove glitch that they had, which is actually here. Uh, let me, it will fill. They called this, where is per doves? Per, I think that per doves is, uh, is this one. For some reason, I don't know, someone had a very vivid imagination. And they called this kind of, uh, of glitch a per dove. So, uh, when they did that, they figured out that one of the detector mirrors was actually moving, oscillating at a very low frequency. They, did, they hadn't observed it before, the scientists. They corrected it. And as far as I know, the, the specific typology of glitches was there no more after that. So, let's get started and see what happens here. So, you have a tutorial in uh, Gravity Spy, okay, which shows exactly what these uh, things look like. So everything is there for you to, to investigate further. And now here, I believe that you can understand better than yesterday what we have in this plot. Can someone help me uh, explain this one, please? Someone? What What is this plot that we see? It's a gravitational wave, and you've got the frequency on the y-axis, the time on the x, the x, y axis, and the color is high intensity. The, the color is there? The intensity of the energy. Exactly, yes. So, so it is a spectrogram, actually, right? Yes. Perfect. Yes. Exactly. exactly. So, so now we understand that. And you can see that this is a blip, as we call it. You can, if you have an interactive uh, spectrogram tool, you can find many of them online, like the one I sent you or others. You can actually play a bit with your students. Maybe you can try to create a blip and see how it sounds like. We will definitely do that in Rainforest. We will transform this into sound. So, we have this one and we have three typologies of glitches offered at the first stage, the blip, which is like that. Okay, 
we have the whistle, which is like that, and we have none of the above. Maybe it's something else that we cannot identify. Right now, what do you think you observe? Bleep. 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 Done. Yep. Okay. Another bleep. Another bleep. And uh, done. This one? Whistle. Mm -hmm. whistle. Whistle. I've got a question. Yes. Because we are only looking at the shape of um, the, the bleep or what, whatsoever. But um, is nobody trying to measure uh, how wide or how high the bleep is? Because yesterday you've shown us, uh, not yesterday, but the, the from the time, you sh you've shown us some shapes which are not much different. So is, is there no, nobody trying to measure the size of the signal, of the, of the glitch, uh -huh. to classify them better? Well, at the first stage, what uh, Gravity Spy people want uh, the citizens to, to contribute in is just a pattern recognition. Okay. At the next steps, when you have, but they have to sign in uh, in order to do that, but we will do that actually. Uh, you have, you can go uh, deeper than that. Now I go to a more uh, detailed one. You can actually discuss about these topics. I mean, what you, do, you not, don't need to just identify the shape. You may say that this is a blip, okay? You identify it and you want to talk about it. So you can do that, okay? You can leave a note about the subject and say, for example, uh, I find this very beautiful. This is actually what I will write. I wrote that. Okay. I find this very beautiful. So, uh, of course, you, you don't need to add uh, silly comments uh, like I did right now, but I just want to show you the utility. Uh, people might want to answer also here. Okay. Uh, but you might want to, to search more, to ask more. Definitely, Gravity Spy is uh, the first step. In uh, It is something that already exists and it is something that we want to build on our approach. So I'm doing a couple of more and then we proceed, okay? Yes, but what I mean is if a blip is um, around 100 frequency and another one is around 500 frequency, certainly the, the, source, the sources are not the same. Well, that's a good question. I don't have the answer to that. So it could be useful to measure the frequency range and, and maybe the, the time range as well. This is something that you can actually talk directly to the scientists uh, observing this and you can do it as a project with your students. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the, it, I believe that this is a... What do you think? With whistle. whistle. Done. Whistle? Whistle. Haha, <laughs> what is that? Koi fish. Koi fish. They are similar to blip, but uh, they, they look like fish. Okay, so I identify that as koi fish. So what I would like to ask you uh, is uh, beyond uh, your general observations, I would like to, to ask for some specific uh, observations as well here. Maybe you can add them to the chat or maybe you can uh, add them in uh, the evaluation that will be done later. Okay, because for uh, what Rainforce is doing right now is that it prepares the generation two of Gravity Spy. So if you play a bit with that, we would really like your feedback. We will, we will ask for it now regarding what you saw, but it, it would be very, very helpful for us to receive it. I mean, do you believe that uh, it is clear for your students? Do you believe that uh, whatever, this, all these questions. So, with the, that final power line, is that a power line? 
Yeah. Whistle. Whistle. Are we sure it's not a power line? I don't whistle. remember all the power whistle. line is. It's a whistle. No. Okay, so with the final whistle, I stop. <laughs> I would like to thank you very much uh, for, for your attention. And uh, if you have any questions, I'm uh, at your disposal. Thank you very much. Thank you. Something? Can I ask something? Yes. Can you hear me? Uh, yes. I uh, was thinking about inclusive education and uh, about the scientist that uh, had lost uh, her um, visual and uh, she was hearing uh, these uh, things and um, the data and uh, could we uh, use uh, the spectrograms and uh, i musica and yes. combine it with uh, 3d printing maybe yes yes the answer okay. Marina, the, the answer is yes and this is something that uh, we are happy to to discuss because Wanda is actually a part of this consortium, is part of Rainforest. Oh. Uh -huh. And, uh, and uh, we have every uh, demonstrator that we will produce will be also, uh, all the images that you see will be in sound as well. We will have the sound of them. And uh, we, will, uh, in the, we will have workshops with vision impaired people. So if we have any of you who have experience in working, for example, with vision impaired uh, students, it would be a great opportunity to to collaborate on producing material for them. I haven't um, uh, such an experience. I have uh, I had with a student of special education where I used um, uh, I collaborated with a physical education teacher to uh, give him um, uh, to make him understand about uh, the rotation of uh, the Earth around its uh, axis and around. Uh, uh, the sun, stuff like that. And so I was thinking about uh, expanding it and making it uh, also about inclusive education. Yes, yes, yes. The, the, this is a fantastic uh, proposal, actually. And we would love to discuss more with you about that. Okay, okay, thank you. I have a question from Dimitris. Dimitris very correctly points out that sound is a molecule vibrations of the medium. Correct. We have molecules going back and forth and we have the, uh, the, the tops and, uh, you know, we, we have the waves, uh, the longitudinal waves. Gravitational waves is really something totally different, but the vibrations they induce to our detector actually have a frequency in the frequency range of uh, sound. So we can take the data and if we plot the data, we can then transform them through a sonification protocol to sound without need to compress our uh, waveform. Because, you know, when you have uh, infrasounds, for example, and you want to listen to them, you cannot listen to infrasounds. So what do you have to do? You have to do some audio time compression to take the waveform and uh, take it, put it in audacity or another uh, sound... Uh, you know, another program that works with sound, Maria Baruta might be able to say more about that. You compress it and actually you can hear it because by compressing it, you increase its average frequency. Here in gravitational waves, the waveform is already in the acoustic range. So you just need to do some sonification. I mean, just transform the X, Y axis to sound. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, so we don't really listen to them, but we can transform uh, them to acoustic uh, frequencies, if I understood uh, well. Yes. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> Emmanuel said that he has already gone to level three. Manuel, you, you are uh, at a better stage than me right now. <laughs> how, how is it? Oh, it's it's fine. It's you. You are looking, and the experience comes with uh, trying and another one and another one, and then you do it. Mm -hmm. 
Do you do you believe that this will be boring for your students? Um, well, I don't know. Probably for some for the majority, some of that are more interesting. Probably they will they will do it. But then uh, in the time they, if you wanted to read it to see if uh, which frequency what that means, um, that would be nice to explain to them. And probably then we, they will be more motivated. Otherwise, it will be just check, 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 check. Okay, thanks. So I pass the button to, to Jens to, to wrap this up. He has already sent some links for the Mentimeter and it would be very interesting to, to get your feedback on this. So, yeah, so, you know, it's been a, a very interesting two days also for us. And uh, as we said, first of all, thank you, Manolis, for this uh, great presentation of uh, some of the educational uh, resources that already exist and that uh, we can somehow integrate. And obviously for us uh, as a project team, uh, the challenge will be, and our offer to you will be that we will put this in a more, let's say, in a bigger framework. So to make it easier for you to use any of these four citizen science projects that we are currently developing also in the classroom. You know, we just wanted to demonstrate there are already existing resources. Uh, you are working on them. You're already working in terms of frontiers and connecting it to the curriculum. And we hope that in the next half a year or so, we will really be able to offer you uh, let's say a pathway, a learning pathway for introducing these citizen science projects into the, the classroom. So it would be extremely valuable also for us if you could uh, uh, answer, give us really just some small feedback on um, the workshops and on the content. Uh, these are in total again four questions. Uh, you can answer them at your own space I, I'll, because the chat is really lightening up. I'll uh, uh, post the same message again with a link that should directly take you there on the mobile, on, um, yeah, on your browser. And uh, that would be very helpful to get your feedback. And um, otherwise, I thank you for, for joining us uh, these, uh, you know, in total more than five hours now that we have been talking about this. And uh, thank you for your interest. Thank you for making the time and I really hope that we will be able to welcome you very soon again to the next uh, reinforce uh, activity starting. Uh, as I said, we don't have the exact dates, but uh, September, October, once the school year goes off, we will certainly come back to you. Uh, uh, one thing, Daniela, uh, in, the, um, in your question for tomorrow, you don't use the same link. You will use the previous one, the one we had for the last week. I will send an email to everyone tonight with the, the link to Indigo where we will find the recordings and the presentations of yesterday and today. Okay, and uh, I will also share again the link to the, to the Zoom for tomorrow and the day after tomorrow. Uh, may, may I ask... Um, May I ask, uh, uh, Jens, uh, should uh, we do the, the Mentimeter now or should we stop and uh, our colleagues do it uh, at their own pace? I mean, maybe it would be interesting to have some uh, feedback right now, if possible. What uh, do you think? I, I think it's better now because I, I can see that uh, they are just answering. Uh, okay. Okay, and, okay, uh, okay. Yeah. But uh, we will share, or Manolis will share with you, uh, you know, once you're done, once we have collected the responses, we can uh, share with you a PDF uh, where you can see all the slides and all the answers given. I think this might be also interesting for you. So you, you will see the results, but um, uh, I, I don't think it's a good idea now uh, to, to go through them all together. Okay. So any... A last remark from my side. First of all, Jens, thank you very much for organizing this uh, two-day workshop. Uh, it, it was a great uh, honor and pleasure to have uh, all this uh, awesome organization in, uh, in, in the Frontier Summer School. And we, are really, uh, we really need to point out that Rainforce is the continuation of Frontiers and uh, we want to work on this way.
yeah, well, let me give you that right back without you and your great work also in Frontiers and in Reinforce, none of this would have happened today and yesterday. So, so th thank you all very much and uh, see you tomorrow. So enjoy the final days in Frontiers. Good luck with uh, you, your students and uh, let's hope that we will have a, a good start into the uh, new school year without uh, much interruption. Enjoy your summer. That's goodbye from me. Uh, I guess you will see Manolis again tomorrow. So I yes. wish you all a nice summer and hope to see you soon again in Reinforce in any of the other of the ESEA projects. And yeah. Bye bye. Enjoy. Jens. Bye bye. Bye, Jens. Bye. Stay well. Stay well. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye, bye Manolis. Until tomorrow. Bye bye. See you bye -bye. tomorrow. Bye -bye.